Hello everyone, my name is Gada Zamzmi and I'm a researcher in the National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health. My research focuses on enhancing healthcare of vulnerable population using AI technologies. I will talk today about two applications, infant pain assessment and disease risk uh, stratification for vulnerable patients. Here is a disclaimer. And here is the outline for my talk. Uh, I will start by brief background. Uh, I will then cover the pain assessment application for infants and the sickle cell disease disease, uh, the sickle cell disease risk stratification. I will conclude by discussing some current challenges that prevent the wide adoption of healthcare, uh, the wide adoption of AI technology in healthcare. During my talk, please feel free to stop me uh, if you have any question. I want to start by briefly talking about vulnerable population, who they are and why they need our attention. Vulnerable population are physically or socially vulnerable groups such as infants, uh, pregnant women, people with some disabilities or those belonging to underserved groups. These group of patients are usually at the highest risk of poor health condition due to several reasons, including their limited, limited accessibility to healthcare resources. One way to enhance their health would be to use technology such as AI because automated technology can actually improve accessibility. It can also provide continuous monitoring. Uh, for example, it can continuously monitor infants when they are left unattended, uh, unattended in the NICU. It can also monitor old people who live alone. Automated technology can also provide standardized and affordable care. Although many recent work reported the potential of using AI in transforming healthcare and decreasing health disparities, the irresponsible development of AI can create several technical and ethical issues that can make things even worse for, for vulnerable patients. So it's important to integrate some responsible principles when developing AI technologies. Examples of these principles include explainability, which means whoever is using the AI technology should understand why the technology is producing this output. Another important principle is that the dynamic analysis of clinical events or clinical signals, precision, full automation, fairness, which means the algorithm or the AI technology has to treat all groups fairly. And finally, reproducibility, which means the algorithm has to give me the same output whenever I run it using the same data. The first application I want to discuss today is the neonatal pain assessment application. Our team has computer scientists and machine learning researcher, pediatrician and nurses from academia and industry. This is our uh, project we made, which has everything related to this project, including the data set and, co and the code. Before proceeding to the method, I want to briefly explain the current practice of pain assessment and how AI can help enhance it. Currently, nurses assist pain by observing some behavioral and physiological signs at different intervals. Specifically, the nurses will check on the baby every two to three hours to see if the baby is showing facial expression of pain, some pain movements, or crying, or, and they also check their vitals. The main issue with this practice is that it's not continuous. Babies may Babies might experience pain when no one is around them, which can lead to under-treatment. Another issue is the need to train nurses to perform pain assessment. And even with training, the assessment provided by nurses can be inconsistent due to inner observer variation. These issues can lead to poor management of pain, which can cause many issues, including uh, Pre, uh, impacted brain development, increased pain sensitivity, and several other serious issues reported in the literature. 
Also, a major issue of the current practice is that it does it only allows to react to pain when it's detected. A better solution would be to prevent pain from happening, which is more proactive. This proactive approach of pain management can be accomplished easily using the AI technology. AI can be used to build a technology that monitors different uh, that monitors different signals of pain, including video signal, audio signals, and vital signs. It also can provide re it can also provide real time assessment and predict pain prior to onset. By providing early pain prediction, we are giving the nurses enough time to control pain before it reaches before it reaches the onset. This figure shows how pain prediction prior to pain onset could create a time window for controlling pain using fast acting medication. Also providing the early pain prediction can help flatten this curve for the recurring cycle of pain and pain treatment, which can lead to less toxic stress. It can lead to, le uh, to smaller peaks and valleys which can lead to less stress uh, on babies in the NICU. Other benefits of automating pain uh, assessment include continuous monitoring, uh, better accessibility and portability, and efficiency in terms of time and cost. This slide shows an overall view of the system, which contains different computer vision and machine learning algorithms to analyze different behavioral and physiological pain signals. The system will take a video signal, which contains the face and body, audio signals, and vital signs as input. For each of these pain signals, if, if, if the signal is detected, it will be processed using feature encoder. If the signal is missing, it will be constructed using reconstruction algorithm. After reconstructing the modality and extracting the features, these features will be processed by a classifier to detect pain. If the pain is detected, a system alarm will be created. Otherwise, the system continue monitoring different pain signals. We built our system using um, a USF University of South Florida multimodal pain data set. The data are collected using a GoPro camera. The camera is used to record the face and body region. So this, like, uh, I think it's small, but uh, I hope you can see it. Here's the camera uh, installed in the camera stand. And we use this camera, the GoPro camera, to record the infant face and body. The vital signs are recorded using a vital signs monitor. <coughs> we also use vital sync for data synchronization, for synchronizing the vital signs data with the video data. In addition to pain signals, each infant has some clinical data recorded. Examples of these clinical data include the infant age, feeding time, medication dose, medication type, and so on. The infants are recorded during two major pain, procedural pain and postoperative pain. Procedural pain happens during a quick procedure, such as um, immunization or heel lancing. It starts as soon as the procedure starts and ends as soon as the procedure ends. The infants were also recording during a postoperative pain, which means they were recording they were recorded after a major surgery. We recorded the infant before the surgery, fifteen minutes before the surgery, to get their baseline, and also during the surgery and after the surgery for up to three hours to record their their postoperative pain. This table summarizes the infant demographic. And this picture shows example from our data set. As shown in this figure, the data set is very challenging with cases that have occlusion due to the wrong pose or due to the oxygen mask, 
or the blanket. So for example, here and here, we see that the entire body is fully occluded by the blanket. When assessing the pain, trained nurses give labels as no pain, moderate pain, or severe pain. We assess the agreement between the, uh, the nurses' labels using CABA coefficients, and those, key, those cases of disagreement between the nurses, we exclude them from further analysis. To analyze different pain signals, we propose the multimodal approach that is designed and developed for the challenging NICU environments. Our approach is lightweight and is capable of constructing missing modalities. It achieved good performance generating both pain score and pain intensity. The proposed approach has three main stages. In the first stage, we used LSTM-based autoencoder with unlabeled data to learn spatio-temporal features from the signals, from the pain signals. So basically, we use an LSTM encoder to learn the temporal and spatular features from the pain signals. Then in the second stage, we use variational autoencoder to learn the joint probability distribution of these four vectors corresponding to the four different pain signals, the face, the body, the audio, and the vital signs. So here in this modality, we, uh, in this stage, we learn joint feature distribu distribution. And the main purpose of this stage is to be able to learn the distribution of the missing modality for construction. And I want to note here that this stage is very important for this application specifically because missing modality or missing data is very, very common in the ICU. After, the, after, after generating um, the feature vector and after generating the feature vectors and reconstructing the missing modalities, we stacked the latent features of face, body, audio, and vital signs signals and applied a multi-head transformer encoder to learn the cross-model relation. Finally, the attentive features were concatenated and used as a final feature vector to generate the pain label or the pain intensity. To train our approach, we use external data set along with our data set. And we reported the performance here. The first table shows the performance of the individual modality and the multimodal. So here we see the performance of the face modality alone, the body modality alone, the audio modality alone, and finally the, multi, uh, the multimodal. As we can see here, like the audio signal achieved the best performance compared to other modalities. And we believe this is attributed to the fact that audio signal has the least noise as compared to face and body. Um, like, so basically what we mean by the audio has less noise, like if we go back here to this image, you can see that in many cases, the body is fully occluded and the face is covered by oxygen mask or because the baby is lying down on the left side or right side. But we, so all this variation adds some noise to the body and face um, signal, but noise, um, but the noise in the audio signal is the less compared to the body and face. So it makes sense that the audio signal give me the best performance. And the most, like, or the highest performance among all of them was given by the multimodality. Um, the multimodality achieved uh, an accuracy of 83 and an AUC of 91. The AUC for the individual modalities and the for multimodal is shown in this stroke curve. We we then compared the performance of our method with our previous method and another state-of-the-art approach. Our previous method, the only difference between this 
our recent method and our previous method is that we don't have modality construction in our previous mo uh, method. We compared our current approach with the modality construction with our previous method and a re another recent work in the literature. And we found that our current proposed approach as she outperforms both of them. It, it achieves like the highest or the best performance. To, to assist the importance of modality construction, we also performed an experiment to report the pain performance with and without modality construction. In this table, I only showed two modalities. Here, we can see that the performance of these individual modality, for example, the performance of the sound modality with modality construction after we construct it, it's higher than the performance using uh, without constructing the sound. So if we construct the sound, the performance is 80, the accuracy is 80, but if we don't construct the sound, the, perform the accuracy is 76. And similarly with the face, if we drop the face completely and we don't construct the face modality, the performance is 70%. If we construct construct the face modality, the performance is seventy four uh, uh, percent. So these results shows that our approach, which can reconstruct the missing modalities, improve pain assessment performance. We also did another experiment to uh, to evaluate the generalizability of our approach across different. Uh, gender, ethnicity, age, and birth weight groups. And from the, this table, we can see that the performance across group is not significant. So there, there, is, there is some difference in the performance, for example, between the male and female, but this difference in the performance is not significant after we perform the statistical significant analysis with B value of 0.05. To summarize, I presented an AI-based approach for pain assessment that is designed and evaluated in the neonatal ICU environment. The proposed approach is fast. It actually takes like less than three seconds to generate the label. It can also provide assessment under missing modality or missing data, which is very important in the NICU environment. And it shows good generalizability across different patient groups. However, this approach should be extended to, to include explainability and it requires further evaluation using larger and more diverse data sets. We're currently performing evaluation using data set collecting from, collected from John Hopkins Children's Center and Stanford Medicine uh, Children's Health. Before presenting the second project, I just want to pause and ask if anyone has questions for me. The second project is about using AI technology for sickle cell disease risk stratification. This project is a collaborative effort between computer scientists, medical imaging and machine learning researchers from uh, NLM, and the clinical center at NIH, and a cardiologist and sickle cell disease scientist from the NHLBI Institute in the National Institute of Health. Sickle cell is a disease that impacts more than 100,000 patients in the US and more than 20 million globally. The majority of these patients are from underserved groups and they live in low income setting with very limited resources. This limitation is a major cause of sickle cell disease mortality and morbidity. Another reason that impacts sickle cell disease mortality is the shortage of physician, um, which is increasing as shown in this figure. This figure, which is created by the Association of American Medical College, 
project projects a huge national shortage of physician by two, 2033 this shortage This huge shortage, along with the limited accessibility, is really causing a huge issue for sickle cell disease patients. So to solve this problem, a portable AI-based technology can be used to expand access to sickle cell disease care. In 2021, Vandana, who's a, ma who's a major collaborator in this project, analyzed more than 250 imaging clinical and lab biomarkers from 600 patients in the, in the clinical center at NIH. The main goal of this study, which was published in 2021, was to find the most predictive sickle cell disease biomarker. In this figure, we can see a ranking of the variable from the least to the most important, um, here is the least and here is the most important. And then we can see that the majority of the predictors are coming from the echocardiography. Like uh, the yellow or gold dots represent echocardiography biomarkers. And we can see a like the majority of the biomarkers are coming from the echocardiography. The study, this study concluded that there are nine highly predictive predict, predict predictive variables, which are the age, the body mass index, the HR, heart rate, TRV, TR velocity, mitral valve velocity, septal wall thickness, right atrial pressure, ALP and bond. Those nine variables are highly predictive of sickle cell disease progression. Four of these variables are coming from the echocardiography imaging modality, and the rest are coming from the patient uh, uh, health record. In the next slides, I will present how the AI technology can be used to extract these variables from both the echo imaging modality and from the patient health record. This picture shows a summary of the current process and where the automation is added. The process starts when the doctor requests both cardiac screening and lab order. The lab order will be performed and the results will be saved in the patient health record. For the, echocardio uh, for the echocardiogram, the acquisition stage takes less, less than one hour then the captured data will be saved locally or in the cloud. Without, without any automation, the specialist will need to spend a few, uh, few hours to find the right view of the heart and also to assess the quality of the, this specific view. If like this view has good quality or bad quality, then perform manual or visual quantification of specific cardiac biomarkers. With automation, the entire process can be performed much, much faster. The system will take the data from the cloud, perform automated view classification, automated quality assessment, and fully automated biomarker quantification. And the entire process would take like less than three seconds. Then we, uh, we would, like the, the AI technology can also um, get the uh, like the lab and clinical data from the patient health record automatically and combine them with the day, uh, with the biomarker extracted from the echocardiography and automatically perform data fusion and disease analysis. This entire automation process saved time and decreased the cost. It's also consistent and reproducible. And finally, it can increase the accessibility um, to healthcare service. Be because basically, this is an AI technology that can be written as a software. This software can be installed in a, uh, in a handheld device or a smartphone and then can be used in low income settings. So using this automation framework can greatly enhance the accessibility. 
In the next slide, I will explain how signal processing and machine learning algorithm can extract and process non-imaging and imaging predictors. We developed an ECOQUAN technology. This is a fully automated system for echocardiography quantification. Our system takes an our system takes an echo study as input, performs quality assessment, then selects a, a specific or target view, segment the cardiac region in this view, and finally extract specific biomarkers from the segmented region in each frame, which allows generating this temporal curve. Here, for example, um, this is the left ventricle, so the system, uh, like the system segments, like the different cardiac region in this view, like the blue region is the left ventricle, the orange region is the, is the posterior wall, and the yellow, yellow region is the septal wall. And we wanted to calculate the thickness of each of these regions. For example, the left ventricle um, wall thickness. If we did the calculation in each video frame, we will get um, a temporal curves. We, we will get those calculated biomarkers over frames, which generate this curve. Then the output of the ECOQUAN, which is which are like the output, basically it's the bio, uh, the cardiac biomarker. Those cardiac biomarkers will be combined with the clinical and lab data, and both of them, the lab and clinical data, and the cardiac biomarker will be used to do disease diagnosis and prognosis. Our system is designed for open world setting. It's lightweight, explainable, and can perform full automation of eco task from start to end. In the first stage, we used a multi-head approach with a shared encoder and task-specific decoders to perform view classification and quality assessment. In the second stage, we use a lightweight segmentation network to segment different cardiac regions. This network was published um, in IEEE access um, in, in Elsevier medical image analysis. If you're interested in knowing uh, the details of our novel segmentation network, please refer, um, go read like this paper. Finally, in the last stage, we use the quantification component that takes the six segmented region in each frame and convert them into cardiac biomarkers. We then plot those cardiac biomarkers over frames. For example, this yellow or gold curve represents the left ventricle uh, diameter. Uh, those curves, like at the bottom, represent the like the, I think it's the septal wall thickness and the posterior wall thickness. Our system is also efficient and lightweight, which makes it suitable for top portable devices and smartphone devices. In, actually, like the system is suitable for any resource limited devices. It can be like tablets, smartphone, or any other portable devices. This this video shows uh, a demo of running our system uh, on a specific um, on a specific eco study to produce this biomarker over time. So I'm gonna play this. You can see here that our system, like in each frame of this video, calculate the specific biomarker. For example, here we're calculating the left ven the left ventricle thickness and then the thickness of the wall surrounded by the, uh, surrounding the left ventricle. We're doing the calculation in each frame, which allows generating these temporal curves. I just want to remind you that right now, doctors in the clinical practice actually do this calculation manual, manually or visually. Basically, they need to look at each frame manually and then do the calculation here, here, and here. Uh, this takes a lot of time. Like doctors, they need a lot of time to, um, to do this process 
which might not be accurate at the end. But then when we automate this entire process, we don't just speed up the calculation, we create more consistent and more accurate calculation of the biomarkers. Um, another major benefit of uh, our algorithm ability to perform this real-time calculation of biomarker is that it encourages like doctors to record um, eco study over longer periods of time, uh, which can be helpful with some patients. Right now, like for example, most uh, echocardiography study, most echo uh, videos, they are recorded over three to four cardiac cycles. With this technology, we can record the um, video or the echo studies over like, let's say nine or 10 cardiac cycles, allowing to do more analysis and deeper analysis of specific uh, patients. We also integrate explainability to our system using Explainer, uh, which is an open source visual analytics framework for interactive and explainable machine learning. Here, uh, we use GradCam based visual explanation, which means um, like the algorithm will highlight the most important region in the image that was used to produce the prediction or the result. For example, here the algorithm think this is a good quality Doppler because the envelope is very, very clear. And the algorithm thinks this is a good quality blacks view of the heart because the LV, the left ventricle and its walls are visible like like the boundaries are visible and the walls and the left ventricles, like they're, they're very visible. Here, like we can see that the algorithm highlighted the region of the segmented um, cardiac chamber and the red, the red color, it means those are the most important region that are highlighted by, by the algorithm to do the segmentation. Basically, the GradCam visual explanation method highlights the most important region that was used for producing the output in red and the rest um, in blue or green color. Like green, it's less important and blue, it means it's not important. We also use histogram, histogram based uh, method for, explain, for explaining the output. Basically, for this image shows an ex example of the histogram based method. The algorithm classified this image as poor Doppler because um, like the like the, the the pixel intensity histogram is much less or is very different than the pixel intensity histogram in this image. And this makes sense because the, the pixel distribution is much less here inside the envelope, then this is a poor envelope. We don't really see the envelope, but then because the pixel distribution here, here is very high, then we can see clearly see the envelope, which means this is an excellent um, view of the Doppler envelope. To evaluate our EchoQuant system, we use two data set. The first one is an EchoNet a data set, which is provided by Stanford University. And the second data set, it's an NIH data set that contains 475 patients who did uh, echocardiography test in the clinical center. The, NI, the NIH data set uh, is collected using different system and has 50% male and 50% female. Uh, race, uh, race wise, um, like our data set has white patients, African-American patients, Asian patients, and also patients belonging to other racial groups. To assist the performance of EchoQuan, we compared the automatically extracted imaging biomarker with the expert value. Here we see the correlation plots and correlation coefficient for the TR velocity. And we compare the automatically extracted TR velocity with the expert, the human expert velocity. And we find that they're, they're very cool, like, like the automated value and human value, they're really correlated. Uh, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.99, and this is the correlation plot. 
We also measured the correlation between the automated and expert mitral valve velocity, and we again find very high correlation with a value of 0 0.98. And uh, we calculated the correlation between the automated septal wall thickness and the expert human expert septal wall thickness, and we find a very high correlation of 0 0.99. Uh, to compute the correlation between the right atrial pressure uh, of human and the automated right atrial pressure, we use the confusion matrix um, because basically like um, the right atrial pressure has cl class. It, it doesn't have continuous value. It doesn't have numerical value. It has uh, four classes, five, 10, 15, and 20. So we couldn't use the correlation plot uh, we instead use the confusion matrix. And from the confusion matrix, we can see that uh, like the agreement between the expert and human is very high with a range of almost 86 to 100. So those four variables represent the most important or predictive variable for sickle cell disease uh, risk stratification. And the four of them are extracted from the echocardiography modality. To extract the non-imaging predictor from the patient health rec uh, record, uh, a flexible pre-processing pipeline for clinical data, which is called FIDL, can be used. This, uh, this library or this software can really um, extract data from the patient record easily and convert them to, num to numerical tensors that can be used by any machine learning algorithm. As we can see here, this is an input, which is the patient health record with the age, sex, and different uh, variables. And what we do in the next step is pre-filtering. Pre-filtering means is that you eliminate or remove unwanted variables. So if I'm not interested in... Um, like um, in these two variable in gray, if I don't need to use them for my further analysis. I just uh, remove them and keep the rest of the variable. Then those variable will be transformed or converted into tensors to either time invariant tensors or time dependent tensors. So with this, with this library or with this toolbox, like it's very easy to take any patient health record and convert it into a tensors that can be used with any machine learning algorithm. After extracting the bio, uh, the imaging biomarker from the echocardiography modality and the clinical information from the patient health records, we combine them together to create three different level uh, for sickle cell disease risk, either as high risk, medium risk, or low risk. To evaluate the performance of our uh, technology, which has both components, ECOQUAN for analyzing the echocardiography and uh, FIDDLE for extracting the clinical information, then combining both of them to do the risk stratification. So to evaluate the performance for sickle cell str disease stratification, we another data set, uh, another NIH data set uh, is used. This data set has 600 patients. The data set has 51 female, and the majority of patients are African and Latin, uh, which makes sense because this disease, sickle cell disease, is most common with uh, in African American and Latin population. We use the automated models to extract the imaging and non-imaging biomarkers and then perform thresholding on each of the extracted variables. So, for example, if the extracted age variable is less than um, 50, then the score will be zero, otherwise will be one. If the BMI in the uh, like value is less than 35, then the value is zero, otherwise it's one. And it's the same with the value extracted from the echocardiography imaging modality. If the value of the calculated uh, TRV is less than three, then the score will be zero, otherwise it's it will be one. For each of the calculated variable, for each of the calculated biomarkers, we perform thresholding to convert those value into a score of zero or one. 
we then combine these scores um, together uh, to generate like three different classes as like, uh, for example, if the score, if the score is from two, uh, one to two, I think the like the patient will be classified as low risk patient. If the score is from three to four, the patient will be classified as medium risk patient. If the score is larger than four, then the patient will be classified as high risk patient. To summarize, I presented an open world, lightweight, explainable, and real-time system for echocardiography analysis. By combining echo indices with clinical data, sickle cell disease analysis can be done precisely, portably, and rapidly. Currently, we're working on conducting further evaluation on a larger NIH data set, and we also plan to evaluate the system on external data sets collected by some external institutes. I will end the talk by touching on some of the scientific and ethical challenge facing the widespread adoption of AI in healthcare. These challenges can be categorized into technical challenge, such as the algorithm ability to generalize across settings and data set, explainability and efficiency. Actually, I noticed a lot of work in medical imaging or AI for healthcare focus more on performance than generalizability, interoperability, or fairness. There is always a tra trade off, for example, between fairness and performance. But in order really to build a system that can be deployed in real world setting, efficiency, interable, uh, explainability, generalizability, fairness, all these issues has to be addressed and considered. There is also some data challenge, um, like including limited accessibility to large and high quality data and annotation. So if the data is bad, the algorithm is bad. Like, uh, as we know, garbage in, garbage out. So um, like currently one of the major challenge uh, of using AI in healthcare is that we don't have large and high quality data that we can use to build the system. In addition to technical and data challenge, there are some challenges related to privacy and legal, regu and legal regulations, as well as Leah, Leah uh, sorry. So in addition to technical and data challenge, there are some challenges related to privacy and legal regulations. And finally, even if we address all these challenge, even if we address the technical data and regulation challenge, the use of the AI technology can face resistance from organization due to the fear of change. This is um, like in our human nature, people, they fear new things. There is a huge fear of change by institution. Or sometimes people, they refuse the change. They refuse AI in, uh, integration into their organization because they, they lack in-house skills to operate those technology. So, Really, in order to build AI technology that make difference in healthcare industry, we need to address all these challenge. That's the end of my talk, and I'm, I'm happy to take any question. Thank you. Mm -hmm.